Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's us again here to hopefully make your life a hell of a lot easier on your AB business management course. Revision notes for 1.2 types of business entities. Enjoy. Our starting point is your definitions. The difference between public and private sectors. Now the problem you're going to face depending on where you are in the world, the public sector could be larger or smaller um, compared to the private sector. So if you've got a large public sector, lots of things like utilities, gas, electricity, water, etc., could still be in the public sector. If you've got a small public sector, you could have very, very few things left in the public sector. It's basic government departments, police, civil service, military. So make sure you look at your specific situation you're in, the country you're in. Um, how big is the public sector? How big is the private sector? The public sector is basically that section of the economy which is controlled by the government. Uh, businesses run by the government on behalf of the taxpayer, normally to provide a service. Whereas the private sector tend to be profit orientated businesses. Public sector tend to be service orientated businesses. Right. Then they expect you guys to be able to go through the various types of business structures and evaluate them. It doesn't have to be in massive detail, but obviously make sure you can comment accordingly. So sole traders, smallest form of business. A lot of people have a business idea. He or she will set up that business on their own. Yeah, so you own and run the business. No legal distinction exists which is a bit of a problem in the sense that if you're sued, you're sued personally because the business and you are one and the same thing by law. Limited access to finance, you tend to be a small business, a new business startup, so it's your personal savings. The banks will not look very favorably at you, think you're too high risk. But advantage in terms of normally close to your customer, provide a more personalized service, more personalized service, you may be able to charge premium prices and maximize your profits. Limited accountability compared to, again, the limited companies. You don't have to register the business. You don't have to file your accounts. So again, saves your time, saves your money. Now the overall evaluation of a sole trade is relatively straightforward if you take a look at what we've got here. Um, Think realistically that it's great to set up a business sole trader. All the profits come to you. Think about possibly possibilities of competition. Think about stress levels. You are also you're running HR, marketing. I mean, everything falls on you. Privacy, again, useful, flexible working hours. You work for yourself, decide what to do, when you want to work, how you want to work, etc. So make sure you can come up with evaluated points, two to three on each side of the equation. Now, a lot of students are confused. They think you automatically have to start as a sole trader. You can start a business as a partnership. You and a friend may have some money you've saved, inheritance, whatever. And you decide the two of you, you've got uh, suitable skills, you complement each other, and you're going to set up a business. So it's normally between two and 20 people setting up in a business. Now, the benefits of a partnership versus sole trader, because there's more than one person, normally greater access to finance. But again, same idea with sole traders, partnerships, as unlimited liability. A the problem there, because there's no distinction between the business and the owners of the business, in this case, the partners, any debts of the business okay, come to you. They can grab the business assets and also your personal assets to pay off any debts. So, again, there's a risk to it. Also, partnerships, joint decision making may allow more effective decisions because there's different viewpoints, but again, slows down decision making. Make sure you're confident with terminology, things like sleeping partners. They're just individuals who invest money in the business, but take no part in the day-to-day -day operation of the business. And a deed of partnership. A deed of partnership basically is contract for the partners. If you join a partnership or you set up a partnership, you need a deed of partnership. That sets out the rights and responsibilities, division of profits, division of losses, etc. 
who's put what in uh, partnerships are more stable and sole traders again larger finance great chance of surviving changing market conditions you're normally a larger business for the purposes of ib you do not need to know about limited liability partnerships they exist in some countries around the world the uk has them partnerships very very popular with large professionals lawyers accountants architects and in the uk you can have limited uh, liability partnerships but for the exam the ib course don't worry about that okay now, you've mentioned most of the points already but again you're going to get a summary of the advantages stroke drawbacks of partnerships um, which again fairly fairly straightforward but focus on productivity potential profitability rather than being that sole trader that one person business if you've got multiple per people now running a business they have different skills again that's going to make you more productive more efficient and therefore potentially higher sales higher profits again disadvantages most have been mentioned previously but i'd emphasize the control idea if you grow your business from a sole trader suddenly become a partnership think about running the business having 100 percent control now you have partners you have to discuss things with again is that a clash, a clash of cultures would that make for a more effective business how are you going to suddenly change the new situation again growing your business you could go from sole trader to partnership to a private health company it is possible to start a business as a private health company now what you're looking at it's the idea that you cannot sell your shares to the general public so again it's friends family associates so it limits the amount of finance available but allows more control because you can decide who is going to buy those shares rather than your shares just being out there on the market being traded and because they tend to be smaller types of business compared to public health businesses the reporting restrictions so again the legal requirements for file accounts publish information etc okay uh it's fairly limited so that cuts back on time cuts back on cost but the major benefit is you now have limited liability so limited liability here it cuts the risk of starting a business operating a business growing a business because if your business fails you will only lose the money you have invested in that business an important point not really emphasized yes for private and public health companies is the idea of separate legal identities so yes you have limited liability with private and public health companies which means if the business fails you only lose what you've actually invested in the business your personal assets are safe irrespective if the business assets are not sufficient to pay off the debts they cannot come after you for personal assets but it's also that separate legal identity the business and the owners are two separate people by law so if you're sued and the damage is awarded it's against the business not you that's irrespective if you are the major shareholder we say 70 percent now ownership and control with public health companies because they're the largest form of business your shares are traded on stock exchange you know potentially hundreds of thousands of shares out there now you could actually own part of the business but you don't actually control it the day-to-day -day management is you know carried out by a professional team of managers and what influence do you actually have it's called divorce of ownership from control if you have not come across that phrase look it up but it simply means the larger the business becomes particularly public health companies the owners of the business have less and less control because they yeah you, know, you might have two three four percent um and therefore what influence you actually have over day to day registration reporting requirements are far more complicated for public health companies you have to choose memorandum association article association file accounts on a regular basis other disclosures so again it's time that's money it's lack of privacy okay but there is accountability as well requirement for agms annual general meetings but you do have greater access to finance the largest most stable forms of business normally who've grown over time become very powerful organizations you mentioned most of the points already in terms of your evaluation advantages versus disadvantages 
So just take a look through. Make sure you're confident with you know being able to produce some evaluative points. Talking about this so potential business structure. Now realistically, you need to think about growth of businesses. That one person business who sets up on their own and suddenly over time turns into a multinational public traded shares company, publicly held company. However, it is possible to set your business up as a private held company or a partnership. But think about growth, think about the benefits, think about drawbacks and the most appropriate business structure for a certain situation. Now, for profit social enterprise terminology, make sure you're confident with what a social enterprise actually is, what social purpose is. So it's normally businesses who are there for profit orientated, but they set up for the benefit of the members and cooperatives. Cooperatives are your main form of this. It's a business run for the benefit of its members and run by all its members. And you've got different types of financial, housing, workers, different forms out there. Lots of cooperatives out there as well. Coffee growing market, chocolate production, etc. So find examples for your notes. Make sure you have them because there's heavy emphasis on the IB course now about normal, supposedly normal businesses, privately held, publicly held partnerships, etc. And you've got for profit and not for profit social enterprise. So be confident what social enterprise is, confident what cooperative is, and what social purpose is. And the cooperatives will look to make a profit, but not to maximise profit. Look for examples of the different types, particularly the producer cooperatives. They're really useful. And there's obviously some really good consumer cooperatives around. But the producer cooperatives, I've got olive oil there. Um, what is it? The olive oil presses may be too expensive for one individual olive oil farmer. So you work together in a cooperative. You also join together in that cooperative to sell your produce. So instead of being one individual farmer who's negotiated down on their prices by the large supermarket chains, if you join together in a cooperative and you offer all of your produce, you have more power in terms of selling it on you have access to machinery the processing it's olive oil rather than just selling olives you can now produce your own olive oil you can use communal presses so look at the benefits there yes money has to be made but the social purpose could be about increasing quality of life making enough money to take people out of poverty and or pay for school fees etc so look for examples then life becomes a lot easier here Particularly producer cooperatives, they're really, really useful. Not for profit, just basic term, for profit on its head. Uh, terminology surplus, instead of profit, they're looking to make a surplus. Now, it's not to make profit, it's money which is kept within the business, the enterprise, which goes towards funding the good works. Exist for a purpose. Give me the examples of Red Cross and Red Crescent. The surplus, any money made, goes straight back into the business to fund its operation. It's not paid out its dividends to shareholders, distributors, profit to anybody else. So it's not profit in that sense. They're not profit oriented businesses, but they will make surpluses. And all surpluses are used by the organisation to ensure it can actually achieve its purpose, grow the business, okay, to spread the, you know, the achievement on purpose in more countries. Make sure you know what NGO is, and again, examples. I've given you Greenpeace here, which is involved in multiple issues. Uh, political, non-political links. Political, you could have the National Rifle Association, they had the gun lobby in the US. NGOs are independent of government interference, and they're a form of okay, this type of organizational structure we're looking at. Um, keep it simple. Get your example, okay, why do these people exist? Now, an NGO could have a specific purpose. Some people may argue it's still a um, It's there for good deeds. Or then you look at charities. Charities are there specifically for good deeds. Help people can't help themselves. Emergency aid, specific natural disasters, wars, 
no interest in politics so there's no agendas some ngos could have their own personal agendas the reasons they actually exist to publicize and push forward their cause their ideas again not influenced by government operates in the private sector charities tend not to have to pay taxes ngos will that's profit orientated business charitable status exists if you have charitable status that means you're exempt from paying tax which again helps that specific business achieve its aims <laughs>